Bethany Gagné, founder of the Albany Peace Project. And today, I'm lucky to be here with John Welshens, who is um, a friend of mine for many years now. And uh, John, you were a meditation leader last year, and I know a lot of people really appreciated what you had to say. You've been meditating for 47 years? Mm -hmm. That's right. 47 years. Yeah. Can you talk to people about what inspires you to keep going? Well, probably the same answer I gave last year. Yeah. I don't know what else to do. <laughs> I mean, I think that um, there really is no practice more significant than going within and finding who we truly are. And if we want to make the world a better place, if we mm. want to bring peace to the world, peace starts with peaceful people. It's right. not a concept, it's an actual state of being. Right. And so it's just been my intention since I was part of the peace movement in the 1960s ah. and the, during the Vietnam War mm -hmm. and during all of the uh, racial strife in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And we came to understand that anger wasn't going to solve the problem. Right. But peacefulness and love and kindness and generosity will. Mm -hmm. And then we realize from practicing meditation that those things are all who we truly are. They're aspects of the deepest level of our being. In other words, there is our personality and our mind that's full of thoughts and opinions and data that we've gathered over the years. But underneath all of that is just pure awareness mm -hmm. that never changes. And mm -hmm. that's really what we're seeking in meditation, right. is to go to that place of pure awareness that never changes. And it turns out, interestingly enough, that the qualities of that place are peacefulness, mm. love, kindness, joy. Right. All the things we all want are actually inside us all the time. Right, right. Yeah. And I'm so glad you brought that out because I think a lot of times people do feel as though meditation is somewhere that you go or this great place that you ascend to. Where really it's, it seems to be this place underneath the noisy chatter of the mind, right? Exactly. exactly. So that it isn't like you're creating something that isn't there. Right. You're quieting down enough to realize what's already there. Right. You know, that part of you, that essential beingness in us all. Yeah. That's been exactly the same since before we were born. Right. You know, we had this awareness in our mother's womb. Right, right. And we come out and everybody's teaching us things and telling us who we are and what life is all about. And we forget yeah. that we have this essential pure awareness. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, again, I've been out teaching a lot in, in schools and stuff. And, and let's talk about the resistance that people have to going to this peaceful place. So you think, okay, there's this great place within you. I say this gorgeous place of coherence. You know, why... Why don't people kind of want to dive down and find it? Well, because this culture raises us to think that we're going to find happiness outside ourselves. Right, right. That we're going to find it by achieving things and acquiring material possessions and wealth. And um, so it's very hard for us to start to turn and realize that that was wrong. You right. know, that everything pretty much that the culture has taught us about how to find happiness really is wrong. Yeah, yeah. 180 degrees, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not wrong in, in the sense of being evil, it's just right. misguided. Yes, yes. You know, it won't get us there. Yeah. It's teaching us to pursue a mirage. Yeah. You know, so that yeah. you think you're getting closer to the goal and it keeps moving away from you. Right, right. So the idea that we find happiness inside ourselves is so revolutionary in this culture. It's not in Eastern cultures, you know, in Asia particularly, India, China, Japan, places like that. They've known about these practices for thousands of years. Right. But in our culture, this is new. And what's causing people to let go of the resistance that you're talking about is suffering. It's uh, just that they're miserable. Right, you know, right. There's so much anxiety right. and so much depression right. that um, people are starting to feel desperate and they'll try anything now. Yeah. And then the next step is that there's some resistance because meditation can be a challenge. 
just in the sense that you have to do it in order for it to work. Right, right. And sometimes people have a hard time finding the discipline right. to do it regularly, the time in their day to do right. it regularly. So let's talk about that as far as motivating people because it's really easy to think, ah, oh, it's just meditation, it will make a difference on my to-do list today. Oh, if I don't get it done, it's not a big deal. As long as I get this stuff done, you know. Right. So, so let's just talk about that because it's so easy to just blow it up and think, ah, oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> You know, but we know that there's this cumulative effect that if, you know, so if you could say anything to inspire people to keep meditation on their to-do list. Well, I mean, I think that that is also a new concept in our culture. Not the concept of trying to find happiness has always been with us. But now that we're beginning to see that we can't find it in the ways we've tried to find it, um, it's really a process of learning to take care of yourself. You know, yeah. so I mean, as you were saying earlier, you're asking why I have continued to do this. It's because, especially in the early days, I suffered if I didn't. Mm -hmm. You know, I mm -hmm. realized that I was more anxious, more agitated, more frustrated, more angry, all of that stuff. And I had come to a point where I realized that that wasn't happiness. You right. know, right. there's no way to ever be angry enough to get happy. <laughs> it just doesn't work. Yeah, right. It doesn't work. Though. And <laughs> happiness comes from finding a way to let go of your anger. So right. for me, that's been meditation. Right. Yeah. So, and and that's another thing. I I often say that we in our culture we kind of marinate in uh, kind of negativity. We get so used to being in that negative space that people kind of acclimate themselves to it and just feel as though that low level noise becomes the norm. But yours, the way you were just describing it is, you had to have a level of awareness within you to recognize, I'm suffering now. I could choose not to, right? Right, right. And that sensitivity, can we talk about that? That almost, I talk about it becoming intolerant of being miserable. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, can you, so right. you must have reached, so can you talk about that space? Because people need to know about that space. Well, the truth is, when I was a teenager, I was so unhappy. Both of my parents were alcoholics. Mm. They had everything that the culture says you need to have to be happy. They had money, they had a nice house, they had nice cars. You know, right. my mother had furs and jewelry and all this stuff. And they were absolutely miserable. And right. they drank themselves to death. Yeah. Literally. Wow. And watching that helped me to see that, of course, while they were miserable, they were making me miserable. Yeah. Yeah. So it was the, what was your phrase, being intolerant? Uh, intolerant of being miserable. Intolerant of being miserable. Well, that's, you know, when you reach the pinnacle of misery. Right, right. There's two things to do. When I was a teenager, I thought I would kill myself. Mm -hmm. I really seriously considered suicide a lot. Mm -hmm. And something would whisper in my ear, hang in there, it might get better. And so I always thought, okay, okay, I'll keep hanging in. And it's gotten so much better. And a right. large part of that has been meditation. Right. And um, realizing that there's a certain point at which you've reached your bottom or you've reached your breaking point where mm -hmm. you just can't take any more suffering. So if then you begin to see suffering, anger is suffering, it's terrible suffering. Right. Depression is suffering, anxiety is suffering. Right you can make the choice to say, I would like to get free of my suffering. Yeah. And once you make that choice, I don't think there's any more powerful technology than right. meditation. You know, that it's just, I just love that. I am free to, how did you put it, to um, be free of my suffering. Right, right. So people need to know that that's a choice. It's a choice. That's an option. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, so I'd love to talk more on this, but tell people about your books that, um, that you've written, and a lot of it really is about teaching people how to manage their suffering, right? Mm -hmm. You've written um, the first Awakening, one was Awakening from Grief. Awakening from Grief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's about how to deal with the dramatic life changes that we don't want and don't expect. And, um, and then there, the next book was When Prayers Aren't Answered, right. which is basically sort of the next level after you get through the initial suffering then you start to ask, if there is a God, how could he, she, or it allow things to happen the way they're happening on this planet and in my life? Right. How, right. If, if that being is all loving, how could they allow this to be the way it is? How could they allow this much suffering? So that book reflects on those questions. And then there's One Soul, One Love, One Heart, 
the sacred path to healing all relationships. Mm. And that really sort of ties it all together because the truth is there's an awful lot of grief in relationships. Mm. And it right. basically boils down to the fact that when we have difficulties in relationship, it's because we want the other person to be different than they are. Ah, uh, yeah. And we grieve because they aren't. And we grieve because they're not loving us the way we feel we want to be loved or we deserve to be loved, right. or you know, they're not behaving in the way we want them to, or they're behaving in a self-destructive way. Mm. So there are all of these issues in relationship that are arising out of us having difficulty accepting things the way they are. Now I always want to add that in meditation we learn to accept the world the way it is, accept our life the way it is, accept our body the way it is, be at peace with it the way it is. That doesn't mean leaving it the way it is necessarily. Right. So that you learn how you can change. Right. How can you can change yourself, you can change the world. And you learn to apply that wonderful prayer that says, grant me the serenity to accept the things mm -hmm. I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, yeah. and the wisdom to know the difference. Right. So all of that is enhanced by meditation because you start to realize that there are certain things you can't change. Right. You know, you really can't change another person. Right. The only thing we have any hope of changing is ourselves mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. our relationship with the world. Right. The way we see it, the way we perceive it, the way we react to it. Right. right. That's what we have control over. Right. And um, so the peace comes from just allowing things to be as they are, understanding that this planet that we live on is a difficult place. Right. You know, and right. it's a place that's full of change and unpredictability and people who aren't nice and people who are confused and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. But the fact of the matter is, since the truth is that none of our peacefulness and our contentment can be stolen by those external circumstances if we remember that where we find it is in here. So if we're upset by external circumstances, which most of us are, mm -hmm. you know, if we just keep remembering that the place to find peace is inside ourselves and it's always there. It's always there, always right? There. Right, absolutely. So um, certainly your books will help people kind of reach those places within as they're going through some real gritty stuff. That's what I like about your work. You, you address some gritty questions and I like yeah. that. Well, I like to look at life honestly. Right. You know, I think that uh, my friend Ram Dass used to use a term. He would say that um, people have a tendency to up level on the spiritual path, meaning that um, you think when you're working on yourself spiritually through meditation and other practices, that the best thing to do is just ignore the stuff on the earth that you don't like. Mm. And that's a good strategy temporarily sometimes to just get free and get clear and let yourself calm down and get centered. Right. But the truth of the matter is it's still there right. and people are still suffering. Yeah. And I think there's a way in which if we turn away from that, we're going into a place of, it's actually what I sometimes call ostrich yoga. <laughs> <laughs> where we're burying our heads in the sand in order to be free. That's not the path to freedom. Right, path right. to freedom is being able to see it all yeah. and honor it all and look at it all and experience it all without losing that center of peace. Right, right. And there's a peace that comes with that clarity as well mm -hmm. when you're able to look at things head on and uh, see it warts and all. Just the and way it is. Exactly. Yeah. Great peace there. So. Yeah. Well, thank you, John, so much. You're going to be doing a meditation with us. Okay. And, um... Lovely. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you.